that we so welcome uh, again to this webinar uh, we will have a question and answer session uh, at the end but feel free uh, to use the question and answer uh, box the feature on zoom to ask any questions uh, while our uh, experts are uh, presenting so Again, welcome everybody. I know we have some uh, renowned uh, members of the Blue Cloud community, but I also see some newcomers to this webinar. And so I'm very pleased as Blue Cloud coordinator to just give you a brief introduction again about Blue Cloud that we like to call your open science platform for collaborative marine research. So Blue Cloud uh, is the future of the seas and oceans flagship initiative of the uh, European Union Horizon 2020 uh, program. And it's the thematic um, open science cloud for the marine uh, domain. Uh, it aims to promote the uh, sharing of data processes and research findings by delivering a collaborative uh, web-based environment that allows you to uh, access an unprecedented amount of marine data resources uh, as well as interoperable uh, services and products that will allow you and other researchers to perform research we hope in a better way. The project started in 2019 and features uh, 20 uh, partners across Europe but what's a strategic in, uh, in the uh, Blue Cloud framework is that uh, Blue Cloud is federating uh, European horizontal infrastructures such as uh, uh, EUDAT, D4 Science, uh, uh, Copernicus Diaz, uh, Wikio, with uh, 13 um, blue data infrastructures. Uh, and together they create this virtual space where you can access all together data tools and services to perform your research in a uh, more efficient uh, way. Five uh, virtual labs are developed as real life demonstrators, uh, making use of the data and the services uh, available in the Blue Cloud virtual research environment. And they address specific challenges uh, in biodiversity, genomics, uh, environment, fisheries, and aquaculture domains. And today uh, we'll be very happy to hear uh, the novelties of the uh, virtual lab dedicated to zoa and phytoplankton essential ocean variable products which we call uh, demonstrator number one so what will you uh, learn today uh, first of all <laughs> you learn why plankton is important in the function of the coastal and open oceans ecosystems and why understanding the, the changes in across time and geography of plankton is important to uh, understand the health of our ecosystems and in general the responses to climate change. Then you learn more about the zoo and phytoplankton essential ocean variable products demonstrator, where uh, you can find three different products that will allow researchers to generate a free 3D um, vertical distribution of chlorophyll concentrations. Um, to generate zooplankton distribution maps over a period of time and uh, spatial areas, and uh, also to run a modeling service that um, help understand uh, how uh, photo and zooplankton uh, production changes uh, across uh, time and space in the ocean. So last month, so between the 7th and the 9th of February 2022, uh, Blue Cloud ran its first uh, uh, hackathon that was open to marine researchers, data scientists, ICT experts, innovators and students to uh, test the Blue Cloud virtual research environment and the virtual labs and the services and products uh, that are available there. So we had um, almost 150 participants from 39 countries, of which 20 European countries. We were very proud of the feedback received uh, by these end users. And now I like to say that it's your turn. So we hope that this webinar will entice your curiosity and your interest in the virtual labs and will uh, help you um, ask us questions and, and, and have your try in, within Blue Cloud uh, uh, environment. With that now, I'm happy to give the floor to back to Patricia. So, uh, 
Yeah, I think you can you share this much. screen. So Patricia is uh, from the uh, Flanders um, Research Marine Institute in, uh, in Belgium, Leeds, and she's uh, one of the uh, leading uh, partners of the Zoan Phytoplankton uh, Demonstrator. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, so, yeah, I was uh, leading a, a team of researchers that develop this work. Uh, so before they explain us uh, in detail how they develop the, the methods and the results, I will just uh, quickly explain why do we are studying plankton uh, and also some, some basic information about how to enter in the VLAB and where is everything in the virtual lab. Uh, so, as you all may know, uh, plankton uh, are very little uh, tiny creatures that are in the ocean and they are very important because uh, they found they are the foundation of uh, many of the marine trophic uh, webs in the ocean. So they uh, are, have also a great contribution in biogeochemical cycles in the ocean, like for instance, phytoplankton do contribute for approximately 50% of the global earth photosynthesis by capturing CO2 from the atmosphere and releasing uh, oxygen. And as well, uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton uh, do contribute to the biological carbon pump. Uh, so zooplankton feeds on phytoplankton and uh, both serve as the basis of the higher uh, um, species in the trophic webs, uh, like sea turtles, jellyfish, fishes, and up to the human, uh, as that we depend uh, on the ecosystem services that the ocean is providing to us. But uh, what can happen uh, if uh, these little uh, creatures disappear in the ocean? So the whole, uh, the whole ecosystem can collapse. And therefore, that's why uh, we, we need to study them and understand uh, how, how are the changes uh, uh, will affect in the future to, to, the, to the ecosystem. So for this, there is a lot of ways to, to study plankton and in general, the, the whole ecosystem. And as we are advancing in technologies, uh, there is a much more, a, a different way how we are uh, taking these observations. It is faster and uh, we're taking much more data. And uh, all this data, it is scattered through a lot of different uh, data infrastructures. Uh, which uh, is the reason why Blue Cloud uh, comes comes into into play to really federate all these data infrastructures, but as well to provide many other services that have helped us to develop this this demonstrator, and how this happened. So uh, through the access uh, data access and service to all these data infrastructures I just showed, uh, we were able to have. Uh, there is, uh, it is easier to have an, an integration of the different data sources in the same space, which is the virtual research environment or VRE, which also allows us uh, to perform a heavy computational analysis, for instance, using the Jupyter uh, hub or the RStudio server that is in the virtual research environment, amongst other uh, services. Uh, as well, we work in this environment, the VLAB, the, the, that I will show you in a second, and there we are able to, to have to work collaboratively between everyone with all these uh, different data and using all these services. And finally, we can also exploit these results such it was done in the hackathon or we're hoping that with these webinars, people get to know more the, this demonstrator and can jump in and use it, uh, as well as uh, publishing this uh, through the Blue Data Catalog and also Zenodo and EOSC Catalog. Uh, so those are uh, more or less in a nutshell, what are the services uh, in Blue Cloud? And I will just quickly jump into the homepage. Uh, so as you can see uh, here uh, in the uh, bluecloud.org uh, uh, webpage is where you can find the access to the villa, for example, and there normally uh, if you click here, you will uh, need to register for me because I am already registered. It's just going to jump straight into the, the, the VLAB. So this is the landing page of the VLAB. 
And as you can see here, we have uh, the documentation. So if we if you click in each of these, it will give you all the steps, uh, guidelines and a step by step on how to run the three different products that are gonna be presented just right after uh, me showing you this. And just uh, something uh, that is interesting to clarify is the workspace here. So everything to navigate is these tabs. In the workspace, you land there where all the folders, your own workspace or the shared workspace, which is the VRE folders, is where everything is placed. Input data, scripts, Jupyter notebooks, R markdowns, uh, outputs, results, etc. cetera. Uh, and as well, you have here the R Studio and Jupyter Hope Hub, which is the resources that are exploited for this demo, but there is other resources that can be exploited by, by users. So yeah, that's um, more or less uh, in a nutshell. And now I can uh, let uh, Julia, uh, who is uh, the researcher behind the phytoplankton E of love from the Laboratoire Oceanographique sur Mer from France, that will, will explain you how they did this work. Yeah, Julia. Thank you, Patricia. So good morning, everyone. Um, I am going to present the phytoplankton EOV product that has been developed in Villefranche uh, with my colleagues, Renosh Penipula Remanan, who did a postdoc uh, within the context of Blue Cloud, Raphael Sozet, and Hervé Closter. Uh, next, please. <laughs> Thank you. So, as Patricia said earlier, phytoplankton are key to several. Um, questions relevant to fundamental research or to socioeconomic issues. Not only their biomass, but also their composition critically affect processes in the oceans, in particular the capacity of the ocean to sequester carbon from the atmosphere and also the flow of carbon through the marine food webs. Hence, um, developing capability for obtaining a global 3D view of the biomass and the composition of phytoplankton communities in the oceans is critical, um, in particular to reduce the uncertainties regarding the status of marine ecosystems in the present ocean, and also to gain knowledge and improve our ability to predict their evolution um, under a changing climate with feedback to the entire climate system. Um, in recent years, the BGC, the Biotech Chemical Argo Global Observation Network has, has largely expanded and now provides the in-situ data required to train and validate a new generation of algorithms that are based on machine learning and that represent a powerful tool to develop such a global 3D view of biogeochemistry in the oceans. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in the context of Blue Cloud, the approach that we have used is based on a neural network-based algorithm, uh, the SOC algorithm that has been developed in our group by Rafael Suzet. Um, so this algorithm permits to merge surface satellite observations with depth resolved hydrological properties of the ocean in order to um, develop a global 3D product of the particulate backscattering coefficient, which can easily be converted into the stock of particulate organic carbon, which is a key biogeochemical product. So in the, for the purpose of Blue Cloud, this algorithm has been adapted um, in order to produce global three-dimensional fields of chlorophyll A concentration, which is a proxy, widely used proxy uh, for the phytoplankton biomass, and um, global 3D fields of phytoplankton functional types, so-called PFTs, uh, which are an um, expression of the biodiversity of phytoplankton communities in the ocean, and that in the context of our approach, of our approach are given in terms of chlorophyll concentrations associated with three main phytoplankton groups, picodano and microphytoplankton. Next one, please. So this slide shows the general architecture of the SOCA algorithm with an input layer, an output layer, and several hidden layers in between. So what's important to notice here is the, that the input layer 
is composed of three of three uh, main components: a surface component that includes um, surface observations of the ocean, ocean color observation and altimetry observations. Uh, second, it has a vertical component with depth resolved information on the temperature and salinity in particular, and a geolocation component with the day of the year and the geographic coordinates. And uh, so the output uh, product of this algorithm is going to be a vertical profiles of the chlorophyll concentrations, whether associated with the entire phytoplankton biomass or with um, the three phytoplankton groups I was just referring to, pico and I, microphytoplankton, and these chlorophyll concentration are uh, distributed within the entire water column um, through 50 different uh, depth levels. Next, please. Thank you. Um, so the SOCA algorithm has been developed using an extensive database that's representative as much as possible, at least of the global open ocean. Um, this database comprises um, surface satellite observation of the surface oceans that were matched up with vertical profiles of several variables uh, derived from in situ BGC Argo flood measurements. So 80% of these data were used for the training of the algorithm and the remaining 20% that were of course uh, extracted randomly were used for, for its validation. So on the left, on the right hand side of the slide, uh, you may see that the chlorophyll concentration derived from the algorithm on the y-axis um, compares quite well with the chlorophyll concentration measured in situ with um, air square value of 0.8, a slope that's close to one and a relatively low um, mean relative error of less than 30%. Next slide, please. Um, this slide, on this slide, you can see the scatter plots for the validation of the chlorophyll A concentration associated with a micro on the left, nano in the middle, and pico on the, on the right side of the slide. Um, so these scatter plots tell, tell us that the algorithm performed relatively well for each of the three phytoplankton group. Uh, with relatively low mean error of uh, less than 30%, even less than well, close to 80% for the nano microfat plankton. And what's also interesting to notice is that the algorithm is able to reproduce quite well the um, dynamic of chlorophyll concentration for each group, even for the pico phytoplankton, which is on, on the right hand side, which is usually more difficult to predict because it varies in the very narrow. Um, gradient of chlorophyll concentration. Next slide, please. Um, so one possibility uh, for applying this algorithm and generating the desired phytoplankton EOV product is to use as input to the algorithm um, surface satellite fields and um, depth resolve hydrological property fields derived from the, well taken from the Copernicus CMEMS catalog. So this is what we've done here. I'm going to show you an example of the output product. If you can move to the next one, please. Yes, so that's the global distribution of the, obtained from this application of the algorithm. Uh, chlorophyll A associated with the entire phytoplankton biomass on the left and the three different groups of phytoplankton on the right. Um, that's an example of application for the month of January 2018. And um, the animation shows um, the concentration changing with depth from the surface down to 100, 1000 meter. Um, so that, but that, that's not super easy to visualize. So uh, let me show you on the next one, a cross section that has been extracted for the Western Mediterranean Sea, which is a very dynamic region um, that's been extracted from that global product. And that, uh, that permits, that allows us to visualize the seasonal and the vertical variability of the biomass and composition of the assemblage. Uh, so that's for this, uh, that's in the Ligurian Sea, the Northwestern Mediterranean Sea. 
Um, so as you can see, we observe each year an increase of biomass in the surface layer of the ocean. And that coincides with the um, uh, recurrent spring, spring bloom that occurs each year in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, in, the, in its western basin, and that's followed in summer by a deepening of the biomass and an increased contribution of small phytoplankton. And that's, uh, that's, that coincides with the, this pattern coincides with the summer oligotrophic period. So that's very consistent with expectation knowledge of the distribution of the biomass and PFTs in the global ocean. Um, and I guess that we are moving to my final slide, please. Thank you. So to conclude on the methodological notes, I have to say that additional efforts will need to be made in the near future to improve the PFT product because currently it's a, the, it's a very better version, um, although it provides already satisfactory results. <clears throat> And uh, this being said, the we, we expect that these final, the final global 3D product of cross lane PFT will find a large range of applications. For example, but not only uh, they could be used for fundamental research for precise studies or to draw large scale biogeochemical budgets. Um, this could also be used for the initialization or validation of uh, the new generation of biogeochemical models that are currently explicitly integrate different phytoplankton groups, or uh, for instance, uh, from a more operational perspective, it could also be used, uh, if, if we derive climatological product, it could be used as a reference to qualify near real-time data from a global remote observation network. And I'm done, thank you. Many thanks, Julia. And, and now uh, it's the turn of Charles, Charles Trupin from the yes. University of Liège. Okay, thank you. So I will talk about now the zooplankton EOV developed at the University of Liège, essentially by my colleague Alexander Brat, because of uh, agenda conflict, could not make it uh, today. So what we're doing in Liège, most of the time, we are trying to interpolate data. That's what we show in this figure. So you see all these dots, the typical distribution of uh, measurement, in this case, temperature for a given month at 50 meter depth. And what we want to obtain is something that we see on the right, which is a gridded field, an interpolated field. And it's a typical task in oceanography, but it's not easy because of the data distribution, you have a lot of gaps, but at the same time, you have a lot of data. Then you have the different confidence in the measurement. Some measurements, you trust them a lot because you know them. Some of them are a larger error. And finally, the representativity error, which means we try to create a gridded field, which is representative of the long-term condition using a data collected at given times. So it's, it's, it's difficult. So why you use that? We use these climatologies, this gridded field for model validation, for example, or to assess the long-term change. So there are many uh, usage or typically just the visualization of the data. In this uh, project, we've worked with the CPR data, continuous plankton recorder. They are provided by the MBA, the Marine Biological Association in the UK. And you can see the typical coverage on the map uh, on the top right side. So these types of data, what they consist of, in fact, with a position and then the concentration, a number of individual per cubic uh, meter. And with this data, we want to create uh, a gridded maps as the previous slide. So the data di distribution was uh, good. So we have data since the year 40s and we have uh, even data up to today almost. So the method that we use, it's called uh, DIVA and D. So DIVA probably you heard of. Uh, DIVA means data interpolating variational analysis. And the ND means we are doing that in N dimension. So the dimension can be longitude, latitude, and depth, and time, and other dimension if we have. So the code is uh, available on GitHub. Uh, it's called divendi.gl. GL means it's in Julia. So the Julia is a very powerful language that we have used, we've been using uh, for the last years, and uh, it's very quick, very fast. So it's a good thing for us that when we have to deal with a lot of uh, data. So the application here uh, on the top uh, 
so you see a, a map a typical distribution which is called Acartia, one of the species that we study with 66,000 uh, data points. And the big map in the center is, in fact, the map that we obtain with the interpolation. So we see the concentration, uh, greedy concentration ranging from zero to something more than 300. And it allows us to show uh, which area are more propitious to get uh, to observe more of, of this uh, species. But we did not only do this technique, we also developed a neural network technique. Uh, I will explain you how it works. So the idea behind that is that uh, a given species is driven by different factors, different environmental variables. In this case, can be temperature, for example. We know that temperature will influence them, so we will put all these, uh, what we call them, the core variables inside the neural network to derive the concentration or the probability of occurrence of a given species. So here we have V1, V2, Vn, they are the core variables. F is the neural network and X prime is a residual varying uh, for given uh, length scale within uh, DivineD. So this methodology uh, is, is rather complex, but the idea is yes, to use uh, different variables to reproduce the layers of different uh, species. When we talk about core variables, we need uh, typically the seawater temperature, the seawater salinity, and we take them from the sea data cloud infrastructure. Then we also need the distance from the coast, which is a very relevant variable, the bathymetry from GEPCO, and also nitrate, silicate, and phosphate concentration. We take them from the World Ocean Atlas. So all these data are available within the VRE, uh, the Blue Cloud VRE, and we just need to process them. How does the workflow work? So we want to have a reproducible approach. This means that anybody should be able to, to redo the computation with the same environment. So first of all, we use the version control, which means the code that we run is managed uh, using Git, and in particular, in this case, a GitLab instance at the University of Liège. We use a lot the continuous integration. So for those of you who don't do not this continuous integration means every time we modify or code or change a version of a package, there's a set of tests that are automatically uh, run on a code to check if everything is as expected, that we did not break anything by uh, doing our changes. So it's very important to have this in, in this kind of, of tool. So all the software dependency are declared uh, inside the, the project. And then you have a full snapshot of the dependency tree. So it means you really can uh, recreate the exact same project to rerun the code. We use two Jupyter notebooks. The first one is for the analysis. So it prepares the core variables as we see in the previous slides, uh, split the data into two components. First one for the training, and the other one for the validation. Then it applies DivND plus the neural network approach. And the second notebook is for the visualization of the results, as you can see uh, in this map on the right side. On overview, so you have uh, the main input data, the CPR data. Then on the left side, you have the, uh, the core variables going all together inside the Blue Cloud infrastructure, where the Jupyter Lab instance is run, and we can uh, have our tools or notebooks with uh, Julia running DivND plus the neural network. Some example of results uh, we've called, uh, we've taken again the Arcartia species. On the left, we have the observation, and on the right, the analysis. The same for Oitona, the observation and the analysis. So what you need to note here is that you have a lot of blank areas. So it means in these data, these areas, we don't have data. So it means the expected error is quite high. So with our approach, we can create not only an aggregated field, but also a narrow field. And if the error is above a given value, for example, 30%, we say, okay, we don't want to show the analysis because we don't trust. And typically it means because we don't have measurement. So no measurement means high error. So we don't want to show the analysis when the error is too high. For the analysis, we have uh, also worked on the tight dimensions. We can take all the data all together from the, since the 40s until now, so 60 or 70 years of data, or we can analyze year by year if the data coverage is uh, sufficient. 
We can also dedicate uh, efforts to study the variation over time, which is a very interesting exercise in some cases of uh, species. In this case, we have uh, Calanus ergolandicus and Calanus finmarkicus. And uh, what we've done, we have created all the fields year by year and create an animation for the different uh, concentration. So the problem is that it's often difficult to disentangle the sampling effort from the change uh, of distribution. So every year the, the sampling is not exactly the same. So we can have the impression that the concentration increase or decrease, but it might be an effect of the distribution. So here we show only the gridded field uh, taken into account the error, but we also provide for this case the full gridded field uh, and the error, error field. So a few conclusions of this work. So we really believe that uh, collaborative re virtual research environments, such as the one uh, implemented within uh, Blue Cloud, have a very, very big uh, potential to boost the scientific productivity because it means you don't have to download data, you don't have to install softwares, you don't have to buy a new computer, everything is there for you. You'll be able to capture the relationship between species distribution and environmental parameters using the neural network. So the special and temporal coherence, the constraint used in the, the method, the particular diva allows you to really uh, take into account specific constraints, such as the currents, presence of cost, etc. Possibility, of course, to use irregularly sample observation, which is the reality in most of the variable in the ocean, there are not regularly sampled. And also, as mentioned just before, difficulty to disentangle variability and sampling effort. As a perspective, uh, we think uh, in our case, would like to explore the potential of other techniques, in particular, the convolutional uh, neural network. And we have a method which is called DINKAE, uh, data interpolating convolutional autoencoder that we could or will try on a new data set. And again, make uh, the tool available to, to the community. So that's all for me, thanks. Many thanks, uh, Charles. And while you were presenting, we received a couple of questions. One has been addressed already, was asked by Veronique Creech, and it uh, was about the distribution scale uh, of the phytoplankton biomass. So Julia uh, replied already. I don't know, Julia, if you want to say something, uh, something more uh, also for the benefit of the, the, the others, otherwise, Yes, uh, is can. it better if I type the answer inside the, the Q and A? Or? Yes, it, yes. So we are we are for, for our participants. We are typing the answers. I I believe everybody can see the answers okay, in okay, the. Yeah. But uh, I mean, uh, it was just a way to uh, say some additional clarifications to Julia. Otherwise, there is another question by Laura. Laura. Uh, did you try to use the data from in-situ monitoring program for MSFT assessment? I'm not sure who is this question for. Is for Charles or for Julia? I will try to, to reply anyway in the, the Q&A. Okay, great. So have a look there. And uh, so in the meantime, we can move on. We have a, a, a last presentation by Stephen Kent from the Flanders Marine Institute again. Yes, forgot to unmute myself, sorry for that. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. So here at the Flanders Marine Institute, we were working on the, a model where we were incorporating uh, phyto and zooplankton interactions. And so a short introduction about that, what's important for phytoplankton, what changes uh, or influences is biomass dynamics. It's um, sea surface temperature, nutrients such as phosphorus, nitrogen, silica. Uh, further, we have solar irradiance, and then we also have the interaction with the zooplankton that is grazing on the phytoplankton. Um, why could we use such a model? Because um, the environmental conditions are changing and will continue to change due to climate change. Uh, further, it can be used to predict and mitigate potential effects of blue economy activities. Um, the model can also be useful for monitoring programs to fill in data caps, so it can be used additionally to 
uh, field observation. Further modeling in general can be relatively low cost and a quick method to uh, explore different uh, scenarios and uh, solutions. Further, uh, let me talk about the model itself. It's a nutrient phytoplankton zooplankton model where the interactions are quantified through uh, mathematical equations. You also have to try this in there, but uh, we kept it a constant. So what do we feed to this model? We feed it daily input data uh, from uh, temperature, uh, solar irradiance, and uh, nutrient data. And we create this daily input data with uh, generalized additive models in combination with uh, field observation that we collected from LifeWatch and uh, Flemish monitoring network. So we use uh, field observations with some uh, generalized additive model to create input data for our model. Um, the code for the, the GAM models is also available in, in the Blue Cloud. And our data sources are um, provided and there is an overview provided in, in the VLAB where you can uh, have a look at the data sources and also you have uh, links that take you to our data sources where you can download data for yourself or explore them. And we used data from LifeWatch, Flemish uh, monitoring network, EMOTnet, and a model was built in an open source uh, program, which is R. And the workflow for you, how will you be using the model? It will be in R Studio in, in, in the VLAB. Um, but first you have to download an R Markdown document uh, from the VRE folder in the workspace, which you have to then upload again to your personal workspace. And the R Markdown is basically step-by-step -step guideline that will guide you through the entire process of using the model. There is an introduction first about the modeling approach, about the input data that is used, about the study area in the example um, that's given, and also about the NPZ model, the nutrient phytoplankton and zooplankton model, and how you can use it, what you can adapt to it. Um, you can twist and tweak a little bit around, and, uh, follow the guidelines, and it should be working. Um, further, uh, it will also use your personal workspace. It, the, our markdown document will create a main folder called NPZ folder uh, and some subfolders in there where it will uh, copy the input data, the code that you will be using. It will also store your results in subfolders and also some visualizations in there. Uh, that's we, we did that so it so you don't have to change the working directory, so it's a little bit more user-friendly for you to use. Um, maybe most important for you to know is what can you get out of the model. So the results that you can get from the model is phytoplankton biomass dynamics, of course. So it's a biomass um, expressed in chlorophyll A on the y-axis. It's in a rock scale. It's important to know uh, over time. So the solid black lines are the mean values that are simulated by the model, uh, surrounded by its shaped area, which is the uncertainty of the model. And the black dots are um, field observations. Further, you can also have a look at the interaction between uh, phytoplankton, the black line, and zooplankton, uh, dashed line over time, and how they interact with each other. Uh, we can clearly see that if there is a peak in the black line, so in phytoplankton, it's followed with some time delay by a peak in the zooplankton, a dash line. And that is actually a classic and textbook example of a prey-predator interaction, meaning that the zooplankton is actually grazing on the phytoplankton in the model. And that's what we wanted, so that's good. Um, further, the relative contribution of all these factors that I told you uh, in the introduction that are important for the phytoplankton biomass. Um, in the top row, we have the nutrients. So how important are the nutrients? We have from left to right, nitrogen, phosphorus, and silica. On the bottom row, we have uh, from left to right, solar radiance expressed as photosynthetically active radiation, then sea surface temperature and zooplankton grazing. So here we have the relative contribution, which is the contribution of a factor divided by the contribution of all the factors together over time. And it goes from zero to one. Um, so one is if you combine them all. And 
maybe it's interesting if I show it, show the results in a case study that we did. So we tested our model for the Belgian part of the North Sea, which is really dynamic and coastal area. And we divided it in three uh, regions, the near, mid and offshore region. In the offshore region, we pulled uh, data from all the measuring stations together. So we had sufficient amount of data to create these uh, daily input data that we feed to our model. Then we have the phytoplankton biomass dynamics, and we found uh, that in the top graph, the new show there was the highest phytoplankton biomass uh, located, followed by midshore and offshore region. The difference between the graphs um, doesn't seem much, but remember, we're working with a log scale. So actually, we're, we're talking about the difference of a tenfold, so it's quite a big difference. And um, the two arrows uh, indicate to the the peaks in biomass. Uh, so we have one in during spring, during the spring bloom here at the Belgian coast, and one in autumn. It's a smaller peak, but uh, it's, it was remarkable that we found this because before that there was a period where there was only one peak that was elongated the Belgian part of the North Sea. So this could indicate that the Belgian part of the North Sea switched back to uh, two peak uh, annual cycle. Um, so that was interesting for us to find. Um, further, we have the relative contribution. Um, we combine them here also for all the regions together. So in red, we have the new shore, green, mid shore, and blue, the offshore region. And um, as you can see, there is uh, quite some season, a seasonal cycle. So there is a uh, temporal variability for the nutrients in the top layer, we see that they are most uh, important in contributing the most during uh, springtime and after springtime, after the spring bloom. Um, there is a difference. Uh, the phosphorus is a little bit earlier playing an important role than the other two nutrients, than uh, nitrogen and silica. Um, solar irradiance and sea surface temperature play a more important role during the autumn and the winter time. As and zooplankton grazing is uh, more in uh, summer and autumn after. Um, but there is also quite some uh, spatial variation. And it's also interesting to see that we have found a clear uh, difference and a clear um, near offshore gradient for the nutrients being uh, more limiting in the offshore region. Uh, this is uh, demonstrated here in the top row. Um, that can be due to the fact that we have riverine input from the river Scheldt and it gets depleted towards the offshore region, meaning that there is uh, less nutrients available for phytoplankton in the offshore region. Uh, we found the opposite to be true for the solar irradiance uh, being more uh, limiting or have a, having a higher contribution to the change in phytoplankton biomass in the near shore region. It can be due to the high turbidity. Um, blocking the sunlight that's needed for the, for the, for the photosynthesis. For uh, sea surface temperature, we didn't really find uh, a difference between the regions. And the zooplankton grazing was a little bit lower, or pressure was lower in the offshore region. Um, so that was our case study that we did. We were very happy with the results. And so to conclude, we guess the model contributes to better understanding of spatial temporal dynamics of phytoplankton biomass and also its determinants it can be used to predict whether or not an ecosystem will change under future climate uh, scenarios and or with blue economic activities. The model can be used additionally to field observations in monitoring programs to fill in data gaps. And of course, in general, the Blue Cloud with its VLabs is a powerful tool that has uh, great scientific uh, potentials. Thank you. Uh, you can keep sharing your screen, Stephen. I will just uh, have a little wrap up slide before we jump into the Q&A that will be moderated by Sarah and that I see already some questions there. But just uh, a few a few words and just to put all this scientific research into the blue cloud uh, 
uh, context. Uh, so you can see that there has been a very diverse products developed within this demonstrator. Uh, we have products that are using machine learning techniques and neural networks. Uh, we are covering zooplankton, phytoplankton species in the open ocean and also in the coastal uh, a, a coastal um, ecosystem. Uh, so uh, what is important is that some of these methodologies may need some uh, uh, specific knowledge, uh, such as, uh, for instance, you may think that you need to, to know Julia programming to use the, the zooplankton uh, EOV product, or that you may need to know a lot about the ecosystem model that Stephen just presented. But actually, the reason is that the, the everything is presented in a way that uh, users, uh, and we are targeting a wide vari variety of, of uh, users, can actually test this and build further on this and, and run the, the scripts. Uh, with uh, not a very not a lot of uh, skills uh, needed, uh, so therefore we really invite anyone to to go and uh, use it uh, to explore. And um, here I I give you some of the um, the resources that you can use. Uh, so first of all, that is the link that I think it has been shared already in the chat to access to, to the demonstrator, to the VLAB. Uh, then we have another link that takes you to the handbook, the user's handbook, which contains all the very specific information uh, about our demo, but all the demos. Uh, as well, there is the YouTube channel for Blue Cloud, where there is plenty of tutorials with uh, even uh, live demos on how to find all this documentation that we have put a lot of efforts on really explain, explain well for users. And as well, you can uh, keep an eye on Twitter as we keep uh, having a lot of communications uh, about what is going on in, in the project. So yeah, that's all for the materials and resources. And I think it's uh, now the time to, to jump into the Q&A. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia. And thank you all for presenting today. Yes, the question and answer, answer uh, chat is pretty active, I must say. So I think this is a good uh, sign of the interest. Um, maybe I'll, I'll pick up those that are still unresponded. So there is one question for both, or I presume, I mean, for all speakers. The images that are produced are wonderful. However, it is also important to get some actual statistical results. Is it possible to do some statistics too? I think the question was raised when Charles, I believe when Charles uh, was presenting, but I, I think any of you can reply. I think at least Stephen, isn't it in your script that at the very beginning there is a part that it's really focusing on some visualizations to really understand the patterns on the data. And for sure as well for Charles, I think there is with the CPR data, there is some uh, something done before. So maybe at least, yeah, Stephen, you would like to add anything? No, 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 for me, uh, for my part, there is, there's really the potential to use uh, statistical uh, tools and, and tests on, on our results. Uh, I already used them in the in the box plots so to see or illustrate the significant difference between the regions. So, yeah. Okay, great. And, um, and then we have a, another one. Oh, yes. I mean, it, it's not a question. I mean, I think it's the last of a thread of exchanges between Veronique and, and colleagues at Blue Cloud. Um, and, and thanks. So, Veronique, I understand you're part of the team who is uh, um, working with Jericho. Um, yeah, on via, I mean, see data net and through them via Blue Cloud. So, um, I, 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 the only thing I can say is that uh, we, we have started a very interesting collaboration with Jericho as well uh, in one of the cases where uh, custom uh, materials have been produced we have a virtual lab being implemented so uh, if i yes, can Patricia. add here uh, i think uh, for us it was really interesting to to produce global 
global products because in this way the idea was that we want to show how we can do harmonization of different data types uh, and uh, as well to look at really global regions so it is really like uh, as you see the other products uh, not the phytoplankton one it is focusing more uh, uh, on a smaller scale but always with the idea that we want to uh, really take extend this to uh, global when it is possible just to to look at yeah what, what are the capabilities that we can do so uh, indeed is something that we need to look into how to really translate this to the to the societal uh, challenges and the european uh, directives and that is why we want to provide this in a user friendly way so actually it can be really uh, used and translated to a very different uh, non scientific public so yeah but I understand your point of looking at also regionally, uh, which uh, indeed is done in, in Jericho. Thanks, Patricia. Yes, indeed, there are many opportunities still to exploit. And in, with that, I mean, I, um, I, I reiterate what Patricia invited you to do to, to, to follow the materials, sign up to the virtual lab in case you haven't yet. Uh, there are some uh, uh, even social media say, functionalities that allow you to get in touch with the owners of the virtual labs or, I mean, write to Blue Cloud and we'll point it to the appropriate uh, persons in case you're new and you simply want to uh, understand if uh, uh, we can fit your research uh, case. And with that, unless I see Patricia, you. <laughs> Yeah, I see there is a question for Laura that has been uh, answered, but maybe I can add. Of course. Uh, because, yeah, the, the question was if uh, for the, I guess she was meaning for the Divandi product, the zooplankton product, which aims to use heterogeneous data uh, to have a, a, a better understanding of this heterogeneous data. So she asked if we have used the uh, data from the Black Sea region, which is not very generous. So actually the idea is that we have produced it, we are showcasing how to apply this model uh, or any of these other different methods with some specific data. But the idea is that now everyone can go there and use it. So for instance, if you think this uh, model is really applicable with plankton data from the Black Sea. This is something that you can uh, always take. Every, we made sure that everything is as fair as possible, fair principles, I mean. Uh, so you're able to really reproduce this method and have your product for Black, Black Sea plankton, for instance. So that's just my, my addition that now our idea is not to keep working on this, but actually users to work on it with their ideas and data. Yes, I mean, just to be clear, we had the hackathon last month, but we don't need the hackathon to have users. It's just uh, so uh, really we, we are, we're entering now, let's say the concluding phase, I would say of the project, which is the one dedicated to user testing. So we have effort to support you and to customize, uh, as, I mean, a little bit or as far as uh, uh, the tools allow, I mean, uh, the, the software and the products to your to specific needs, or at least I mean, uh, and this age, what is the bandwidth uh, to really help you adapt uh, the solutions? And since we have few minutes, I suggest uh, Federico, if, if you can turn on, we have a very light survey, and uh, it's a one question actually <laughs> that we would like you to help us with, and this relates to. Uh, let's say the, the sustainability of this model. So we, we need your help to understand for how long would you like the services in particularly the notebooks to be available in these virtual environments. Uh, so you should see the, the tab open on your screen. Just feel free to uh, tick the option that you prefer. We are doing so, as I mentioned, because we, we have still a, uh, few I mean few months ahead but uh, uh, we are working to understand what type of support we should give to newcomers and so even understanding time frames and uh, how long ideally you would like this to be running uh, it's uh, fundamental for uh, understanding sustainability aspects of the project 
I hope, I think, you, Fede, are, are you receiving answers, right? Yes, 60% okay, of the people have replied as of the moment. Great. And uh, maybe while we wait, uh, another few to fill in this survey, unless any of the speakers wants to pick up one of the questions received, it might be of particular interest. And by the way, I can say that you are going to retain these and use them for a frequently asked section that we can have on the website and on the uh, uh, virtual lab page. Uh, Patricia, can you share any insights from the uh, hackathon that might be of interest uh, for uh, participants today? Some case, some questions that you got that uh, can help uh, uh, our listeners today? Uh, yes, actually, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, quite a, a lot of participants uh, that uh, joined the challenge that we were proposing in the theme of, of our demonstrator and demonstrator two, which also deals with uh, plankton, but gen genomics. And there was a specifically a group uh, that had tried to reproduce the Jupyter notebooks from uh, Charles uh, from, uh, and Alex. Uh, and actually it was really interesting to see because it was a team of IT. Uh, there was really a, a, a wide diverse uh, profiles joining in the hackathon. Uh, so there was a marine scientists, but as well the main components of the group were IT that uh, not necessarily knew how uh, Julia or how to use Jupyter Notebook. So it was really interesting to see how in actually even less than three days that lasted the, the hackathon, they were able to really understand, run the Jupyter Notebooks with other data, not the, the data. So do changing a little bit of the code and get uh, really interesting results. So I'm, I think uh, this is showing uh, a lot that uh, someone from, from a different field is able to to really understand uh, like yeah so yeah that's uh, showing that uh, it is uh, also very well done product because uh, it is well reproducible so I will uh, encourage anyone to to see uh, especially with this black sea plankton data I think it uh, could be a really good idea so yeah that's more Thanks, uh, Patricia, and thanks to all our speakers. Do we have the results of the poll? Yes. Okay, so 47% says that they would like to have this service running up to five years, but there is a 53 save even longer. So that's a, that's a good input uh, for us. And... And with that, I think we've done. So the recordings will be available on the website. Give us a couple of days. So feel free to share them with colleagues and uh, partners in your research teams. Special thanks to Patricia, Julia, Charles, and Stephen for presenting today for, and to uh, all our Blue Cloud colleagues working to have this uh, uh, in place. Thank you all of you to you for attending and asking so such interested questions. Let's keep in touch. I mean, now you know how to reach us and how to get in touch with the team behind the virtual labs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.